I'm one of your hosts and moderators. My name is Jamal Crawford, better known as Will the Prophet, aka Matt Turner, Double Burner, and all that types of things there. All right. Give thanks. We have uh, been graciously, graciously given this space right here, which is a beautiful space. Uh, that we fully intend to jam pack with people as everybody comes in straggling. Uh, this is the MIT Walk Auditorium. Uh, Dean Aida Matempu made this all available for us. Uh, what I would like to do first of all is just briefly give you all an overview of what it is that we intend to do throughout this series. Um, in my own eyes, as not only a person who participates in hip hop culture, but as a consumer of it, I've noticed uh, several things that are, are very problematic to me. Uh, a number one, our culture is controlled, dominated, uh, disseminated, all these types, types of things by people who are uh, other than those who created the culture. So what you have is a disenfranchisement from the people who make it to the people who sell it. So that oftentimes myself, find myself as a lover of hip hop, trying to go out and attend and support hip hop events and so-called movements or whatnot, and I'm not able to do so because I find no one there who looks like me. So what I'm trying to do is put together something where we can all come together, discuss all these problems that everybody been talking about for a real long time, but nobody really wants to bring to the forefront. It's something like religion and politics that we deal with with very, like, how they say, kid gloves. No one wants to get dirty and talk about, you know, in a real adult manner, the issues that really affect us all, issues of class, of economics, of race, of culture. You know, no one wants to ask the hard questions in terms of oppression. You see what I'm saying? So that right now, we would be very uh, idiotic to assume that hip hop is somehow in a bubble somewhere and unaffected by all the things that go on in the world. And as brothers will uh, explain to you this evening, you know, hip hop is just, that's a drop in the bucket. We're dealing with some very deep rooted issues that are generational, going back for millennia even. And what we have to do here, as the young folks, who everybody is uh, right now looking at, all the attention is going to the youth. Hip hop is all over the world. How they say, I've been around the world and I, 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 ain't done nothing but show my ass. So what we're gonna come forward right now is show the flip side to this. We're gonna try to put, make some sense out of it all and put some substance with the symbols. So with that, all of y'all should know our brother Wise Intelligent from Poor Righteous Teachers. This brother's gonna come forward and give us a beautiful foundation on which we're gonna build and move forward to our panel. All right? The title of the brother's lecture will be Hip Hop, The Art, The Culture, The War. And what we're dealing here with the panel is Boston Hip Hop, The New Agenda, Breaking Barriers and Building Bridges. I tried to make that as self-explanatory and as clear as I could. Breaking barriers, breaking, an active verb. Breaking barriers. And then building, another active verb, building bridges. So how are we gonna smash what is already there and how are we gonna make something new with which is like a bridge that we can all cross over, we can all uh, get, a, get along. Yeah. Call me Eddie Griffin, because I got jokes. So what we're dealing with right now is really serious, all right? We're about to bring this forward, uh, and what I have tried to do too is promote this on a level and in a way that it has never been promoted before. So I've seen, as once again, as a consumer of hip hop, I've never seen these types of events promoted to where I'm at. This is where I promoted uh, primarily first. I've never seen an event that's been promoted cross generation, cross gener Racially, yeah. so that the elders get the message, the contemporaries get the message, and the youth get the message. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just ridiculous, because I'm moving. With that, I'm going to say this. We're all here in the house tonight. Hopefully, everybody came with a clean mind and clean spirit. And what we're going to deal with right now is nothing but straight knowledge. We try to move this thing forward by any means necessary. And some people don't really understand what that means. But by any means necessary, we try to make this happen. It has to happen. Because if it don't, we got hell to pay. Give thanks. 
I'd like to bring forward the brother Wise Intelligent from Four Righteous Teachers. Rock this fucking joy. Tequila. I mean, stop playing. Peace. Peace. Alright, uh, Blame's wise intelligent, as he just said, of the all but forgotten rap group for righteous teachers. Oh yeah, forgotcha. You know, and um, I'm not a word scholar, nothing like that. You know, I don't have a bunch of degrees on my walls at home, none of that. I'm just a, a urban youth, you know, that makes rap music. That's what I do. You know, it's what I love, it's what I attract to. And uh Everybody have their understanding or idea as to what hip-hop really is, where it came from, who it was originated by, who are the architects of the music. You know, in my opinion, hip-hop is just the voice of an oppressed people, point blank. The youth that make hip-hop music in its beginning were crying out for answers, answers to big questions answers to the confusion as to who and what this people was. Even today, as you go around to your schools, your neighborhood, even your family, your friends, you can pose questions to African-American youth in the inner city. One question, what is your nationality? To your five best friends, and you're gonna get five different answers because we're stuck. We've been stuck for a long time and hip hop is just a reflection of, a, of an oppressed people. Right now, we see the glamour and the glit, the bling bling, everybody, you know, trying to get money. Those are the urban youth who have been deceived into believing that their problem is financial. Right. The problem is not financial. You know, we have political rappers who address political, a lot of political issues, and a lot of them have been deceived into believing that our problem is politics. Our problem is not politics. Our problem is spiritual. It's very spiritual. We have no root. We have nothing to bond under. You know, you look at any race of people who have went through any type of trial, tribulation in their history, and they all came out of it with their culture. And we want to, when America dropped the bomb on Japan, the Japanese didn't lose their culture, their identity, their language. They came out of it pretty cut and dry. So did the so-called Jew. When he went through what he went through, the Holocaust, it was a sad thing, yet they came out of it with their language, their culture, their root, as they knew it before they even went into the situation. But when you look at the black man, woman, and child in America, and you take their tragedy, their Holocaust, into consideration, being drugged over 5,000 some odd miles of water in the bottom of ships, like dogs, cats, like cattle in the cargo hold. One man inhaling another man's vomit, pissing on each other, lying in your own piss, dying in your own excretion. This is like the worst form of slavery ever to take place on the face of the planet. We came here, and once we came here, it wasn't over. The ordeal continued. It was like systematically put together the institution of slavery to crush out all of our memory of who we were. It didn't happen by accident, it was planned. It was a system of control. The only way to control a slave is to cut off his root. It's like trees, you cut off the root, the tree doesn't grow. And that's where we are as a people, from that that right there, we have not recovered from slavery. And we suffer from it now, and it shows in our music. And that's what hip hop is, that's what hip hop is always gonna be until somebody comes with some solutions, you know? And the black man right now, he really needs to have some type of base, something to bond under. You know, we can't say we're Muslims, everybody, like, we have Farrakhan, he's one leader, and he's telling us, all right, we're Muslims, that's the original way of the black man. But then you have Christian movements saying this is the way of the black man. Then you have so many different sects and segments that we have no flag, we have no banner. We're Rastafarians, we're Egyptians, we're Christians, we're Muslims, we're Buddhists, we're 
everything because we don't know what we are. You know, and if you go back into the history of our people, it goes, it's really deep because hip hop is just like jazz. Jazz is just like blues and blues is just like any music ever created on the continent of Africa or even, we can go as far as to say, the esoteric sciences of Egypt, in effect. They were all created by blacks. And now they're all controlled by others, whites in particular. You know, and just like our culture, our identity, we don't have our identity because there's other people who are professing to be us. You know, and hip hop is a product of this situation in a nutshell. For instance, in 70 AD, in Jerusalem, there was a nation of people called Israelites. They were black people. Yet today, when you say Israelite or Jew, it's white man who's being represented as an Israelite or a Jew. Just like when you look on your television and you look at the Egyptian, he's white. How is that possible? You know, that's the biggest lie that has been told. In 70 AD, Titus Flavius Vespasianus, the Roman emperor, conquered Jerusalem. And the Jews of Judah ran into Egypt amongst people who resembled them. Now, if your enemy's coming from the north, you don't go south, you don't go north, do you? You go south. Read to Josephus. Josephus explained this. During his time, there was over 1.5 million Jews living in Egypt. Yet they migrated from Egypt over to the west coast of Africa where they were sold into slavery in the year 1492 to be exact. That's when slavery really started. But we're not being told this. The so-called Jew today, the so-called Jew that occupied the land of Israel, that's fighting with the Palestinian right now, the so-called Jew of Europe, the so-called Jew that makes up the bulk of Western Jewry, he comes from a kingdom called Khazaria, which existed in the Straits of the Caucasus Mountain. They were the mightiest kingdom, one of the mightiest kingdoms in Europe. They had 50,000 men on horseback. No one could convert them. The Caliphate of Baghdad could not convert them to Islam because they were too powerful. The Byzantines of Christianity could not convert them to Christianity because they were too powerful. So to keep their independence, they converted in mass to Judaism. And they've been that way ever since. Since 700 AD. In 865 AD, their kingdom was conquered by Cytoslav, a Russian, part of the Rus, a Slavonic tribe in Europe, who became the Russians. And they fled into Poland and Lithuania. But at the time, it was called, it was just king, well, Slavs called the Poles and the Lits, who became the Polish and the Lithuanians. And this is how they were able to take over a lot of the financial things in Europe, because they were already doing trading with bear skins, and they were seafarers from out of the, they had the waters of the Caspian Sea, they were fishes and things of that nature, so they were minting money and everything. So they took control of the banks for that reason, the Poles, the Lits, and all those Slavs of Europe, the Bulgars, they could not produce cities. They had no knowledge of how to build. They had no knowledge of banking and finance. And that's how Europe became controlled by the so-called Jew financially. And this is not nothing that we just thought up in our heads. This is all fact documented. This man is not who he say he is. When you read in the Torah, it says that at this time, the Israelites should not know who he is. He should have discontinued from his heritage. Who is this man claiming to be us? Now, the same thing happens with hip-hop. We are the original architects of hip-hop, just like the Egyptian esoteric sciences. We are the originators of these things. Yet still, who's impersonating us? Who's becoming us now? Who's taking control of what we created, of our culture? 
The same man that did it before. The same man that keeps us from knowing who we are. Who doesn't want us to know who we are? Because it's to his benefit. We're workers to him. We're going to always be workers to the European. And until we get that fact straight, we're going to be throwing back and forth, back and forth. What is hip hop? What is hip hop about? Hip hop is one scratch, scratch of dandruff off this big head of problems. Hip hop is small. It's very small. And it's not really my concern. My concern is black man knowing who he is. The absolute, complete knowledge of the black man, who he is, what he's about, what is his culture, where did he stem from? Is every black man your brother? That's what's most important right now. It's not about a rap song. It's not about looking fly. It's not about being hood rich. It's not about back that thing up. It's about knowledge. This people, Hosea 4 and 6, this people is destroyed for a lack of knowledge. And that's what our problem is. And until we realize that, we're going to continue to be destroyed. You look at the inner city, and you wonder why we make the music we make. That's frustration. You come into my ghetto where I live at, Trenton, New Jersey, it's like living in an outhouse. Trenton, New Jersey is an outhouse for African Americans. You come in there, everything is owned by someone else. We have Koreans selling us sneakers, hats, airbrush nails, fried chicken, fried chicken cheese steaks, you know what I mean? Everything. They're selling us everything. Bootleg CDs, everything. And now we have Arabs, Arabs in the community selling us fried chicken. Well, on every corner in my neighborhood, there's a Georgia's chicken. I don't know any Arabians from Georgia. Seriously, it, it's that bad, it's that bad. And nobody's doing anything about it. Nobody's trying to do anything about it. You know, everybody's exploiting us, everybody. If you wanna, if you wanna get rich in America, market something to the African American. Seriously. Every little corner store on in my neighborhood is owned by a career. They're selling us they have a jar of pig feet on the counter and a jar of uh, some kind of red hot dog or whatever that is. You know what I mean? And I went in the store one day and I said, yo, why you, you eat this? And he said, no, I don't eat pork. I don't eat pig. So why are you selling it to us? Because we want it. Y'all want it. Y'all want to buy it. That's what he said. There's nothing I can do about that. Then I'm in New York a week later and I run into his daughter. She goes to NYU of selling us cheese steaks and chicken. Our kids are not going to NYU, our kids are going to prison. Our kids are going to the graveyard. That's our most recent address, the local funeral home. You know, and nobody's trying to make no change down there where we live at, nobody. Prisons are popping up. Prisons and arenas are being built like, and you gotta ask yourself at some point, why are they building all these prisons? Why is there a Bell's Bondsman on every corner in my neighborhood? The Bell's Bondsman, the church, the liquor store, and the Korean bodega. You know? It, it's, it's sickening. I'm saying. I thought about it. I sat back, you know, with a couple of my contemporaries, and I said, hey, why not let, let's just open up a prison? Let's, you know, get up some money. We'll, look, $2.5 million. Build us a prison. You know? And, and get taxpayers' money to house the prisoners. You know, every law in our neighborhood, every law they pass is something to hem us up a little bit further to get us locked up even quicker. You know, now there's task force in the neighborhood now. Task force and FBI, the local police doesn't do anything in my neighborhood no more. They come and they kick youngsters' teeth out of their faces. 15 years old, 16 year old, 14 year old, just beating them mercilessly. And nobody's doing anything about it. And it's getting very, very, very heated around my neighborhood. And it's about to turn into an all-out war between the cops and the, and the uh, civilians of my neighborhood. And they see it coming, but it's almost like they want it to happen. It's almost because they want to lock down the neighborhood, haul everybody up and throw them into prisons, and make money off, you know? And that's where hip-hop is. 
That's why the attitude in hip hop is what it is. You know, that's why we say get money, money, power, respect, and fuck the world. That's why. Because we're dying down here. We're dying in the, earth, in the inner city. Everywhere you go is the same thing. You know, I'm trying to figure out still how it's crack coming into the country, jumping over the suburbs and landing in the inner city. It's crazy. You know, I see white kids wandering around in the hood trying to cop heroin. Like, didn't it come through your neighborhood first? It had to to get here. So what are you doing out here? You know, how is the crack getting into our neighborhood? Yeah, we're led to believe that we're the kingpins in our neighborhood. Nowadays, in my neighborhood, or the laws where we live, if you're hit up, if you're caught selling crack cocaine, if you're caught three times with in possession of crack cocaine, you're getting a kingpin charge. A kingpin charge. You know, I can get caught with a half a, well, you can get a white boy get caught with a half a briefcase of powder cocaine in his neighborhood. He's getting probation. Don't do it again. They might put one of those little buzzers on his ankle. Say, stay home for a little while. You know, then you wonder why we think like we think. Why well, everybody's saying, yo, look, I will murder something right now. We're at the end of the rope. We're at the end of the rope. And it's about to blow up. <coughs> really, it's about to blow up. And those guns are going to stop being pointed at one another. We're going to stop saying, yo, it's going to have one thing. You're going to point that gun, and you're going to see yourself. And you're going to learn that at that instant who you should be pointing your gun at. It's about to get real crazy. And nobody's trying to make an effort to stop it. And that's why hip hop is where it's at right now. And as far as white kids doing hip hop and making rap music, Eminem and the rest of the white kids is making hip hop music, I'm not even concerned with that. I don't want to hear about a white boy having sex with his mother. I don't. And that's, that's just me. And I'll tell him in his face and dare him to say something back. That's just me. You know, but I don't want to. I don't want to hear none of that. I don't want to hear about how you you hanging out with your boy sniffing glue. I don't want to hear about that, man. <laughs> Straight up, you want to know what's going on. You want to know what hip hop is. Come down where we live at. Come where we live at. Where we live, we call it Red Brick City because it's all low income housing projects. Red bricks everywhere. That's it. You can lose your life. You can get strung out on. Anything can happen down there. Anything. And everybody has a gun. I can't even front. Everybody has a gun. Very few make it out of here and go to college. Straight up, my little sister is my role model. My little sister is my role model because she's a doctor now. You know? And I'm like, yo, I know what she went through. I know what she went through to achieve that. And it's, it's hard for us where we live at. And a lot of people understand. Like, oh, you can, you can pull yourself up by your bootstraps. You can, you can do it. You really can't do it. There's so many opportunities here for you. But there, there may be some opportunities there, but there's no guidance there. There's no programs to show them, show the youth how to get into these uh, programs or how to be successful, you know? And a lot of the drug dealers that I know in my neighborhood, 85, 75% of them are immediate associates. You know, and they sell drugs because they don't know how to do anything else. That's what they know. That's the way they know how to make a living. That's what they learned first. Ain't nobody coming down there trying to teach them about IRAs, America's money market, how to get into stocks, how to set up pioneer stock program. They're not trying to show them that. Nobody's showing them that. Nobody's telling the drug dealer, look, you stood on this block for a month. In that month, you made $15,000. Two months, you made $30,000. Why don't you take $20,000, $15,000, put it into a blue chip stock program, so when you get locked up, that money will be maturing. <laughs> you know what I mean? You're going to be away for a while. You're gonna, you, know, you understand? I'm saying, put it away. You go away for 10 years. In 10 years, that stock will look like something. The money will look like, no, but they don't know this. They won't even have to sell drugs. But now, when they go to jail, they come out, and they have to go right back to the block. They have to go right back on the corner and continue to sell drugs because they don't know how to do anything else. Nobody's teaching them. Nobody's showing them that they can do something else. You know, and school is a joke. The schools around my neighborhood, now they have charter schools. 
Everybody's open at a charter school. I'm like, wow. What's up with the charter school epidemic? And it's venture capitalists that's opening up the charter schools. And they're getting taxpayers' money, putting it in their pockets, and they're riding through the hood in navigators, just like rappers, bling, iced out watches, and the whole nine. And the kids are not learning nothing. My nephew graduated to ninth grade. He hadn't did homework the whole year. I hadn't seen him do homework the whole year. Not one book report or anything, but he's in the ninth grade. I asked him, did he feel like he earned it? He said, hell yeah. I said, cool, that's all that counts. You know what I mean? What can I tell him? He feel like he's murking his way through life. That's what he's being taught. You know, you can murk your way through. You know, but nobody's trying to change that. Why is that happening in a higher neighborhood and nowhere else? Nowhere else. You know, the rappers, they've been conditioned so bad to do for self, you know, democracy and the weaving of your own little perfect personal nest and the accumulation of private property. They're taking it to the extreme now. You know, the Underground Railroad wasn't set up to free one slave. You know, and what's happening is a lot of rappers, they're becoming millionaires. They're making a lot of money. They're in Forbes magazine, net worth $250 million. A poor youth from the inner city with $250 million. And his only concern is believing the next man. Look at my watch. My watch costs a million dollars. This watch on my wrist cost. Master P was on 106 in Park the other day with a million dollar watch on. I didn't see any metal nowhere on the watch. I couldn't see any metal on it. It was just diamond, a diamond watch. You know? And what's happening is they're becoming oppressors. That's right. They're copying their oppressors. They're getting in a position to make some change and they're dittoing the moves of their slave master. You know what I mean? And they're starting to oppress artists, just as white men, you know, and it's sad. Juvenile, he made Cash Money Records what it was. Right now, he's shopping a new deal. They own $4.5 million, don't want to pay him. Their last deal was worth $200 million. What is $4 million to $200 million? Nothing. But they won't pay him. He's telling them, look, just release me from the label and y'all can keep the money. Just let me off the slave boat. That's all, you know what I mean? It's crazy. You know, then you have like, all right, Jay-Z. I know Jay-Z, you know what I mean? I know Jazzo. Jazzo wrote Jay-Z's first sing. A lot of people don't know that, you know what I mean? That ain't no nigga like going out, he made the beat and the whole idea. Jay-Z just wrote his verse, and you know what I mean? Jazzo wrote Foxy's verse. You know, a lot of people don't know that. But uh, Jazzo put Jay-Z on. Jay-Z was introduced to the hip-hop world through Jazzo's Hawaiian soap. You know, a lot of people don't know that. And today, they're in a big war over attention, over somebody, you know, Jay-Z hasn't done anything for me. You know, this is your man. I'm saying they grew up together. When I met Jay-Z, he came to my projects, you know, he came to my projects with Jazzo. He was introduced to us down in my projects through Jazzo. So, Jazzo was his man. They were like brothers. And why is Jazzo strapped for cash? He, he's not on drugs. He's not on drugs or nothing. He still writes. He still produces. Why, why aren't you paying? You arguing over paying this man five thousand dollars for a beat? I'm just saying, it's it's sickening how rappers is getting all this money and they're becoming their own worst enemy. It's ridiculous. They're not the only one. It's like a long list of rappers, a long list of rappers. You know, then they on MTV Cribs saying, "Yeah, look what I got. Yeah, look what I got. You're not a bully. You're not nothing until you own a Bentley." That's what they're telling us. You're not nothing until you're on a Bentley. That's why they get shot at. I'm telling you, that's exactly why they get shot at. That's why when they come around our neighborhoods, they get robbed. That's right. Point blank. I, you know, BET Sports, we watch BET Sports and Steve Francis on BET Sports. A couple other heads with all that iced out with ice, $127,000 necklace. One necklace, $127,000. You know, how many action schools could I have started with that? You know, but they come around the neighborhood and they get robbed. They get robbed. You know what I mean? Give up the money or lose your life. Give up the necklace or lose your life. And I understand. You're coming through the hood looking like a cheesesteak. 
Has his hungry now. Straight up. You can't. I'm saying. You looking like a cheesesteak, man. You on MTV cribs. Talking about what you got and what we don't got. When this, when every, when all this shit hit the fan, we going to their houses. They're gonna be the first to get. They're gonna get it before white men. Believe you me. They're gonna be the first ones who throw get kicked in. The bunch of Mackie leathers in their face. Like, yo, where's that? We seen you with it on TV. Now where is that? <laughs> Straight up. You know they are. They, they're loose balls, man. They're so disconnected from what needs to be done. It's ridiculous. I'm saying, a brother like Uno with a million dollars. That's scary. That's scary, man. So much can be done. You know, my son, he attends a school. It's called African People's Action School. And this school has like, wow, 400 students, if that many. And these kids, are come, every year, their California Achievement Test scores are the highest in the state of New Jersey. And they get no recognition for it, not that they want it, but they don't get any recognition for it. And no support from black people who can support it. They get no support. I'm saying extensive email campaigns to Oprah Winfrey. Mm. Extensive email campaigns to Quincy Jones and Bill Cosby. Right. They haven't sent one dollar to the school. Not one dollar. It's hard to keep the air conditioning on at the school. You know? But there's no help. There's no help at all. But they have all kinds of programs set up where they're going through these white schools. Yeah. So send someone down there. Michael Jackson. Send some money to the school in Columbine. They're shooting out. They're shooting out in these schools where we live at every day. Man, and you can't even make a, a guest appearance. You know what I mean? You can't even make a guest appearance. Nobody asks you for much. <coughs> Nobody's asking you for much. You know? When did Marcellus would come? When did Marcellus would come? Yes, I'm sure he would. Jazz musicians. You know? That's that's the root. Hip hop is jazz. The inner city is jazz. That's what this thing is about. But we're talking about those who can be the great say. We have a lot of money. We have a lot of fancy cars. We have a lot of jewelry. You know, we have a lot of shit we don't need. You know? And I'm not even asking a lot. Of, I don't even ask you. I'm not asking you to give up your Bentley, your 10,000 cars. Baby from Cash Money on TV boasting about 52 cars. This guy went and bought 52 cars. I kid you not. He said I had 52 cars. So that's what, 208 sets of rims? Somewhere around me? I'm saying, that's a lot of money at $5,000 a set. That's a lot of money, you know? And he can't pay juvenile. But he can buy 52 automobiles. That's a car a week, right? You drive a different car a week. Ignorance, you know, but nobody's addressing it. Everybody's afraid to address it. Everybody's afraid to say something. And those who are not afraid to say something can't get into the forums to say it. You know, I'm saying, if I was accepting a Grammy award, I would say it. I would have to say it, you know, and I would have to leave the Grammy there. I'm not a high worshiper. I don't worship idols. You know, I respect the fans that support me. American Music Award, you know, I am commercially defective. <laughs> Seriously, commercially defective. I have problems. I have issues, you know. But they don't want to hear that. They don't want to hear that. I know all of these rappers, man. I know all of these rappers, and I call them. I call them. And who returned my calls? Professor Griff. <laughs> yeah, <that's right. laughs> Professor Griff returned my call. And then when I run into these guys backstage at shows and parties, like, oh, what's up? What's the deal? What's going on? Like, yo, man, did you get my 2,000 calls? <laughs> you know what I mean? And that goes for all of them. I'm saying it's a long list. Even the so-called conscious rappers. Wycliffe. Most Death. You go down the line of rappers, man. I've called them all. I've called them all. And they don't return any calls. Straight up. Pseudo-revolutionary politicians. I don't fuck with them. Straight up. 
And like I said, they're going to be some of the first ones to get it, but it's it is the fifth. For real. And um, we just have to really right now, like, Uno, he calls me, he reach out, you know what I mean? And I jump to the opportunity. I'm down for that. I, I support Uno in anything that he do, whenever he do it, because this brother is beyond hip-hop with him. He's deeper than hip-hop with him. You know what I'm saying? Hip-hop is, is just, you know, uh, it's like a jumping cable, pretty much. A catalyst that could take us, catapult us into something bigger, you know? And I'm just waiting for one of those guys to, you know, watch his brain. They need brainwashing. Seriously, they need to be brainwashed today. Because these boys out here, if one of them just said, yo, wake up one day and say, yo, donate $10 million to this school right here. I could practically educate an entire city of African American youth, you know. And but they're not doing it. They're not doing it at all, man. It's a little black investment club where I live at called Black Street. And it's you little kids. They're like from they range from ages seven to thirteen. And they invest money into stocks. They're being taught how to become entrepreneurs, you know. Nobody wants to support the program. Nobody wants to support the program. Nobody. So here we have to go and beg some Europeans or somebody to a government program to help out. That's BS. Black man doesn't need one cent from the government right now. Not one cent. The black man needs support from his own people. That's what his problem is. He's not supporting himself. He's a dead man walking. He's a dead man walking, literally. And hey, you look around, things are getting real tight right now. This is crunch time, straight up. You had uh, one of the most notorious gangsters ever in the White House. You, you know, this guy is, you know, I, I know some gangsters, man. These are like chumps compared to this guy. George W. Bush, his dad raised him well. He is the ultimate in terror. And don't be fooled. Don't, don't be lured to sleep by all the patriotism and the... I mean, the World Trade Centers went down for a reason. Those towers went down for a reason. And you have to think, when Bill Clinton was in office, wasn't nobody running airplanes and this shit. <laughs> you know? I would read uh, Senator Muhammad Collins' on the, um, the hip-hop code help or anything you could say about that as far as since September 11th, like how, how hot is it in New York, France? Do you, is there fallout? Is there fallout from that? Hip-hop, hip-hop, is that jokers? We don't need no intelligence on hip-hop. <laughs> These guys are clowns, man. Rappers and clowns, they're not trying to mobilize anything, you know, not trying to do anything. But, uh, like I said, don't be bored to sleep. He says to run around here while they making nano chips and all kind of garbage to put up in your system. You know, they have nano chip technology. I'm reading a pamphlet about nano chip technology where they have a chip, this microscope, you can't see it if they put it in my hand. If I was holding it in my hand, you wouldn't be able to see it. And this chip can be injected in you, and it can, the, they can go into a computer and Send it wherever they want it to any organ in your body. They can say, all right, take out this heart. And this chip will merge <laughs> that organ and destroy it. You know, it's wicked right now. And, and you're mad. I'm telling you, the Bush family, man, I'm telling you, they mean a lot in the whole grand scheme of things. You know, and because Prescott's son of Bush, they have George Bush's father, he financed Hitler. They come here help finance Hitler. Brown Brothers Harriman. They were the New York Stock Exchange. You know, they help finance Hitler. You gotta ask yourself why. <laughs> See, you know, and it's very, very. You ever seen a videotape? It's called the Mina Connection, and it links George Bush, Bill Clinton to the crack epidemic in America. How they bring, they were bringing the cracks in through Arkansas, setting up gangs, setting up bloods and crips in neighborhoods, 
to distribute the drugs, you know? And it's all real, it's all documented fact. Just like right now, today, it's coming out that Oklahoma City and the World Trade Center were connected, you know? And nobody's, nobody's really paying attention. Nobody's paying attention. Everybody's been lured to sleep by get money. Get money. Everybody's on the great paper chase. Everybody's just chasing money. Chasing money, chasing money, chasing money. On my way to New York. I'm on the turnpike. I'm coming across, getting ready to go into the Lincoln Tunnel. And there's a big sign that says, Last one to a billion is a rotten egg. <laughs> you know, you get nothing now if you have a million. It's too easy to get a million now. So they had to up the standard. You're not rich until you got a billion now. Keep running. Keep chasing. You know, these are things that they're using just to keep your attention, keep you distracted from what's really going on. But um, I'm not going to hold up the situation too much longer. We're going to get into the panel discussion or whatever. We we'll know it's going to come down. But uh, in, in closing, just keep your eyes open, man. Keep your eyes open. It's bigger than hip hop. Much bigger. I trust y'all was enlightened by the brother's words, no doubt. And uh, right now we're about to get into the panel portion. But before we do that, we got some question and answer period, all right? So we're going to make sure that everybody has an opportunity to ask a few questions and get a few answers, all right? So anybody that has questions, if you raise your hand or if you can get to the side mics before I can get to you with the cordless mic, all right? Any questions? Questions from the audience? My brother back there. Okay. Give yeah, thanks. Introduce me, y'all. Professor Griff from Public Enemy. Yeah. All right. I'm a moderator. Yeah. I'm host for this event. All right. Yeah, I just want to say this. Um, greetings, first of all. Um, of all the things that you mentioned are going down on a global scale, how come we don't hear this from the hip hop community? There's a lot of subjects that they could talk about, but how can we hear the same? subjects regurgitated over and over and over and then print media and the radio fall right in line along with the videos. For one, for one, we don't control the media. We don't control the media so we can't determine what gets heard and what don't get heard. There's rappers who talking about it. This guy right here. Oh yeah. You know, but Nobody's trying to let him on. What's the name of this radio station here? 97. None of them. You don't hear his records in heavy rotation 30 yeah, times a day. You know? And that's what the problem is. That's I'm saying. We hear it 30 times a day. I got a quarter take again. That's okay. You know, this is what we're hearing. You know, and. It's because the powers that exist don't want that message out there. I'm saying, how can they pull it off if you out there telling people that it's happening? Right. There was an era in hip hop where that's all you heard. Right. Niggas like, yo, I'm saying we gotta shut down the nigga net. <laughs> I'm saying we're learning too much. We gotta shut it down. And it was shut down. It was systematically shut down. You know, rappers are not going to talk about anything different as long as they're making money off of what they're talking about, you know? And that's the thing. We're different. We're a little bit different. We, we desire to say something. We feel like we have an opportunity to put something out there, so we try and put it out there. But it's the media who doesn't want it. Hit. They don't want it out there. BET, man, please. BET, I'm saying. Put me on 106 in part. I'm saying, you can even put me on Old School Wednesday. <laughs> put me on Old School Wednesday, man. I'll be saying some of the clowns you got up there. Yeah, Houdini on there. Give me a break. <laughs> put me on there, man. I'm, they don't want to put us on there, man. Somebody like, will call up Griff Uno. Say, yo, let's go up there, man. Come on, come up here with me. Let's shake something up. Let's go and take his basement. Take it over, son. You know what I mean? Tie that clown up. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know. That's why we don't hear it though, it, it, because they don't want to hear it. BET, I saw NSYNC on BET. 
That's the way that keeps you. Hey, I'm a cool dude, right? I'm gonna stop to answer that one right there. And to say, anybody further got questions, and I'd just like to add, the fact that um, throughout the uh, Black Power Movement, civil rights struggle, and so forth and so on, uh, you know, there, there was something very active called COINTELPRO. Everybody know about that, right? Okay, so if we think the COINTELPRO stopped, we're really joking ourselves. And if we think that it is not uh, still exercised throughout every movement, including the hip-hop one, because two, the two, uh, two-fold mission of that program was to A, discredit, spread disinformation and confusion about what's going on, and B, prevent the rise of a black messiah. You see what I'm saying? So through hip-hop, if a brother looks like this brother's about to get some attention, he actually got talents like, for instance, the fly that I put out. And I want everybody to take notice, because I made the fly, graphic design, give thanks. Oh, yeah. Now, um, when I made that fly, and I put the brother's picture on it, and I put next to that, top five lyricists of all time. You see what I'm saying? To me, that meant such, because when I was coming up, it was brothers like the brothers from Public Enemy. It was the brothers like Poor Righteous Teachers, who showed me new patterns and opened up my horizons to whole new visions. So I know that this brother right here is one of the top five lyricists of all time. And like this brother said, he liked to be on BET. I'd like to see this brother on some uh, Freestyle Friday. Or you notice when these cats come out and pick arbitrary cats to diss? I'd like to see them diss. You see what I'm saying? This brother right here. And, and we hear that answer back. You see what I'm saying? But they won't touch it with a 10-foot pole. But what they will do is avoid it like a moron. Brother Eskia Torre co-founder of the Black Arts Movement. Um, it's an uh, honor to be here with the uh, leaders of the African 21st century. Because, um, uh, my brother, just listening to the commentary from you, uh, don't you see the important need of a dialogue between the generations? Because what has happened, why I'm saying that, and Sister Tricia Rose laid it out in her book, Black Noise, the study of the rise of the hip hop movement. Uh, what has happened to you has been the result of the US government's war against the black liberation movement uh, to turn the inner cities, which were the uh, like the internal black nation that was forming nation time, black top, black people coming together, then you had to move against this, uh, I hate to say this, but it's increasingly true, probably a paradigm that we can relate to in terms of our relationship with a racist, imperialist white America is that of the Palestinians and the Zionist Israelis or the African people in South Africa and the, and the white racist boys. What has happened to you, in one way I want to apologize because we were not able to sustain, sustain the liberation movement and in order to blast us out, to kill Malcolm, to kill Dr. King, to try to wipe out the original Black Panthers and the freedom fighters, they had to devastate the inner cities and then pump tons of drugs into the inner cities. The first Holocaust in the time that, uh, that produced you was the heroin Holocaust when they took drugs from the Golden Triangle in Southeast Asia. The CIA's uh, uh, airplanes, Air America, flew the drugs over and they pumped them on the inner cities where we was in Harlem. Uh, I'm one of the mentors of the original Last Poets. We were in Harlem uh, with Abiy Odun and Omar and the, and the Last Poets. We see little girls going to school with their arms all puffed up and their hands all puffed up, 13 years old, strung out on heroin. And the youth, uh, Brother Hannibal Ahmed and uh, Malik Ahmed, and uh, their brothers work with Brother Malcolm, their oldest brother. And they came to a conference of black police officers. I don't mean to cop on the beat, but black police lieutenants, captains, and, and majors and stuff, and confronted them and said, you are armed black men supposedly upholding the law, quote, unquote, in the black community. What are you going to do to combat the drugs which are destroying our people in Harlem and Brooklyn and so forth, in the Bronx and stuff? You know what them Negroes told those youth? said, we can't touch it 
It comes from higher up. If we try to fight the drug war, we will be shot down in the street and killed. So the young brother said, you're nothing but cowards. You can't even protect. Why are you wearing a uniform? You can't protect your people. So we have to understand that this was the U.S. government's war against our people. What originally that they attempted to do, they mislabeled y'all Generation X and said that y'all were going to be, oh, you poor kids, it's a shame, but really, they are going to be wiped out. Isn't that something? And you all answer them with the hip-hop revolution. And up the only thing is how you begin to, and I'm sure you're going to, consolidate your forces and stuff so you can begin to control all of what you created. I think it's important, though, uh, sisters and brothers, the generations got to sit down so we can exchange experiences and stuff and further reconsolidate our people. It's important. You invite elders, not fools. I ain't talking about sell out neo colonial <laughs> towns. You know, I, I get on you if you invited Colin Powell or something you had. But you know who's who, who the fighters are, those of us who remain. You know, we're still alive, you know. And let us, uh, sisters and brothers, come together and let's dialogue because it's important because you're going to have to take our people forward into the, 20, into the 21st century. Also bring you uh, greetings from Sister Comrade Asada Shakur, our Harriet Tubman. She is strong and revolutionary in Cuba, and she's concerned at what you do. And she wishes you well with love and solidarity. Thank you. Thank you. Again, the of Donald and Reverend T. Ferris, and I want to let y'all know that's why we're here. Because one of the very premises of what we're doing here is just that. As the brother gave me, uh, the theory of generational discontinuity. And each, uh, each, each generation, because we don't speak, we got to continue to reinvent the wheel. That's straight out, out, out the man's mouth, you know what I mean? And I can tell y'all, that's why I'm placing the emphasis on this and putting all these people together. Um, brother, brother man there, I think it is going to be the final question. Uh, we're going to uh, get some comments on, on Brother Skia. We're going to ask this question, and, and then we're going to move right into the panel because time is very short, and uh, I apologize for that. Uh, Waj, you have any comments on that? Professor Griff as well. How we can begin to close that gap. And, you know, uh, I'm, I'm a fan of thinking that with all these ballers, Jay-Z's and you, you know, you who on it. And see, don't let me, like I'm singling out Jay-Z. He's just an icon because he's one of the most popular right now. Because I actually like the brother now. You see what I'm saying? Well, all these cats with all this money, what if, can, can we rent an island or something and get some sort of weekend retreat going on? Because if somehow we can link up our uh, Jay-Z with Farrakhan, if we can link up DMX with a skier, if we can link up, you know what I'm saying, Juvenile with Abby O'Doon and Umar, then maybe, you know, we can get some damn money. <laughs> yeah, thanks for that. Security measures. Yeah, as far as like, as far as like dialogue goes, you know, me, I'm, I'm a little more like subvert. I'm, I believe this is a war. I believe it's a war, and I don't think everybody is fit for a war. I don't think that everybody can sit at the table with generals. I don't think so. I think that some of these guys need to be put out there to be shot at. That's me. That's the way I think. I think that we need decoys. We need spies. We need allies. This is war. We need our own counterintelligence program. We need the counterintelligence program, the counterintelligence program. You know? And I, I believe that you don't need a bunch of brothers. We can take five good brothers. You know? And I think that we should send somebody on MTV Cribs and say, yeah. Word, I'm getting money. Look, I got a 40 inch cable, bang glass tables. Look, I'm living. You know what I mean? But at the end of the day, he's our spot. He's doing what we put him in a position to do, and the money is being used for revolution. That's what war is. That's what revolution is. You know, I'm not trying, I'm dealing with an asymmetrical war plan. I'm not talking about just going together and saying, yo, put this money together, put this money together. You can keep your money. And you can stay over there. We just want to use you as a decoy. That's all. We're going to send our spy right amongst you with tattoos and 40 inch cables on, with iced out medallions and gold teeth. And he's going to look just like you. He's going to talk like you. He's going to walk like you. But he's, he has a bigger plan. 
You know, and I think that's what we need right now. We we don't we, we can't try the old approach. I don't think it's gonna work. It hasn't worked. It's not gonna work. We have all these meetings. They be spending fifty million dollars a year for black caucus meetings, getting together, giving out awards for who the best speaker. Who the best dude? <laughs> Must you clowns. Seriously. You know? So brother. Um, I have a two part question. The first part is about uh, music, the second part is about religion. That uh, you speak about on, on your records. Um, the first question is: um, I bought your first record, Holy Intellect, and it was hot. And uh, this is about music and music publishing. I'm curious if I wanted to use a beat like the Rock This Funky Joint beat and sample it and have somebody to rhyme over. How hard is that to do? Would I have to go through you? Would I have to get publishing and all this other stuff? Or what? No. The second question is. Um, about the nation of God's and earth, the nation of Islam, and then traditional Islam. I know the Honorable Elijah Muhammad taught that Master Farad Muhammad is Allah, and the nation of God's and earth teaches that the black man is God, and that's what you taught on your record. And then I know that the Arabs over in the Middle East believe in the astral, invisible God, and I just want you to touch up on that. Like, how do you see Allah in, uh, in respect to Master Farad Muhammad? All right. Question. First question. You want to use rock this funky joint? We didn't, we didn't know that we had to pay to use it. So, you know, we sampled war. And war, they don't know. Some Jewish guy mm -hmm. named Mark Goldstein or Goldstein or something like that. And but when we used it, we didn't have enough money to say, oh, we're going to clear this sample, we're going to pay you ahead of time. So we had to put the record out and pay later. So we put the record out and we had to pay later. Believe you me, we paid. So if we use that beat, and not just that beat, but any beat, we could just do it, put it out, and then pay later? Because <laughs> well, I mean, I don't have the dough. If you're not right, you don't have the dough, put it out. So we put it out. Your only risk is this. Your only risk is this. You put out a single using a beat that you didn't clear the sample to. You put it out, and it blow up. That's good for you. You weren't nowhere from the beginning. So, so that's better, right? Yes. Than to try yes. To you want to pay later. Don't try to pay in advance. The record might not hit. That's right. <laughs> I mean, but and as far as the second question, um, nation of God's nurse, nation of Islam and Eastern Islam, Master Farad being Allah, being God, I just find a lot of contradictions in certain doctrines, and I don't mess with them. You know, I don't mess with a lot of philosophies no more. I, you know, in my youth, I dealt with philosophies. I don't deal with philosophies no more. I don't deal with any kind of religion. Religion comes from a Greek word, religio, which means to hold back, restrain, or impede. I, I don't deal with those religions. You know, and as far as far being a God and a law, when you look right into 120 degrees, your, one, your 33rd degree and a 1 to 40, it says, what is a real devil? Any live germ grafted from original or any man which is made weak and wicked is a devil. That's the lesson, lesson, word for word. Now, far, according to the nation of Islam, was mixed. One of his parents was Caucasian. So what would that make him according to the 33rd degree? A devil. How would deal with that? You know, so, and, you know, as far as the nation of God's nurse, I really appreciate what, what they gave me. You know, they made me a thinker. But it's very useful because it's based on the same lesson that Far brought to Elijah Muhammad. And it's not accurate. It's just not accurate. And you go through the lessons, lesson for lesson, and you open those lessons up, dissect them, you'll find that out. The black man's way of life is not Islam. It's not. Islam was started by Muhammad, an Ishmaelite, an Ishmaelite, Arabian, and he started that religion based on pagan. It was paganism at first. They were just pagans over there. There were a lot of pagans over there. A lot of pagans just wilding out. They worshipped 360 gods. And Allah was one of them. He said, look, let's narrow it down to one god. I'm killing all you. Bring my army, we're going to kill all you. He said, okay. That's what happened. So that's why I don't deal with religions. I don't deal with religions at all, in no way, form, or fashion.
things. And with that, y'all, uh, we're going to move forward. Uh, we'd like to thank the Brother Wise Intelligent here. Put your hands together for the brother. We'd also like to thank Brother Professor Griff from Public Enemy. Put your hands together. And also as well, Brother Eskia Torre as well. Now we're going to move forward now. Um, we're going to bring forward all of our panelists. And as we do that, I'm going to get this switch microphone. All right, and uh, I'm going to ask all the panelists, everybody knows that they're panelists, come on forward. And as y'all come forward, I'm going to start this off with a little thing that I wrote. All right? What I wrote here, uh, I, I entitled a manifesto. That, that may be a misnomer. Uh, a manifesto, a statement of purpose, a position paper, a list of demands, a doctrine, a dogma, a declaration, an edict. movement, the Harlem Renaissance, Black Power Movement, the Civil Rights Movement, Organization of African Unity, United Negro Improvement Association, Zulu Nation, and view ourselves as a continuation and valuable component of worldwide resistance to oppression of indigenous peoples and their cultures. And, and, and y'all stop me if there's anything that I say that you disagree with. You just yell out. Ah! in recognition of hip-hop as a musical extension of black African culture on par with blues, rock and roll, rhythm and blues, reggae, jazz, and gospel, we seek to preserve and promote it as such. Hip-hop and all of its elements are African in origin. B-boy, break dancing, dance. We know where dance started. People will give break dancing its origins in capoeira. I'm talking about before, before that. You go to Brazil with some brothers who do capoeira, they'll tell you, it's African. Graffiti, art, hieroglyphics, pictograms, written language and symbols. Who was the first people to scribble anything on anything and call it anything? The MC, the Grio, the orator, the storyteller, the scribe, the poet. We know this. The DJ. Y'all be like, okay, how you gonna fit the DJ in there? <laughs> the art of invention. The fact that we had a machine that was meant to do one thing, took that, and made it do something else. Look, y'all. Look, y'all. This right here, this is a what you call it thing, yeah. But in a minute, I'm gonna turn it into an instrument. That's invention. Ingenuity. I give you love in recognition of all these facts and join together in changing the dynamic. Now did y'all hear what I said? Now, do y'all agree with what I said? Now I'm gonna ask a serious question and as I look around, seriously now. Can we here in Boston do something to change this? Or do I gotta start illing out? Because I'm telling you right now what brothers is trying to do first, and I'm being real serious. What brothers is trying to do first is have to talk. Before you slap somebody, in the, you want to talk to them about the problem first. You don't just walk up to nobody and knock them in the mouth, right? You're supposed to talk to them. That's what they tell you, right? Talk to them. So here, this is the talk. This is the talk. All right? I promoted it like I ain't promoted nothing in my life. This is the talk. Everybody who has something to say is supposed to be here now. Because after this, it's fitting to get ugly. Because brothers is hungry, and we're not going to stall. I'm not going to stall. You understand? I got a girl, and it's going to go down for her. She ain't going to be listening to this foolishness, telling her, giving her some image about her that's incorrect. We're going to change this. You understand? Revolution, by any means necessary. Give thanks. This is the plan right here. Brothers and sisters. Are you ready to question the panelists and have the panelists question y'all when we get to this dialogue? Is that all right? This is what's going to go down real quick. I don't think they heard me, though. Is that all right? Uh, I mean, what's wrong with everybody? You need to stand up and stretch yourself. 
I'm being y'all with us? Yeah. You're not scared, are y'all? No. <laughs> right, you're going to talk to me. Cool now, right, this is what we're going to do. We're going to have them introduce themselves real very, briefly. very briefly. And um, we're going to ask them, we're going to throw the question out there. We're just going to exchange some dialogue. Is that cool? Yeah. And yeah. then listen, one, one couple of ground rules. You know, this right here don't count. You're going to raise your hand. Raise your hand so we can see you. Not only that, you're going to ask a question, no long drawn out speeches, all right? Um, I see Officer Friendly out there. I guess he's not going to be in here, but we do have a couple of people that will throw your ass out of here. All right, so, you're so, talking so I get the, I get the, All right? The piano piano. Is that all right? Yeah. All right? I don't know about the foul language because, you know, the English language is only 500 some odd years old. Uh -huh. And I got a thick African tongue. So if you're here to say words like shit, don't pay no attention to that, all right? Shit is an acronym. <laughs> Specialized high intensity training. <laughs> so y'all ready to do this? Alright. Uh, um, it's an African tradition that we let men walk in the door first in case there's some shit in there we need to deal with. But for all practical purposes, we're going to start from that end and work our way back down. It's on you, sister. Okay, I want to. Thank everyone for coming out tonight. Um, we need more forums like this in Boston and hip hop. And I want to thank, first of all, before I introduce myself, thank Uno the Prophet and um, T. Valentino the Ball. I'm not sure who else is involved to keep this on. So uh, uh, welcome. My name is, my name is Nomadic. Uh, I do a hip hop show on WERS 88.9 FM on Tuesdays, which, focus, which focuses primarily on old school hip hop. Um, I try to get a lot of local cats doing their stuff on the show as well, and um, some new joints as well. So it's probably the only station in Boston is free form. One of the few that you would actually hear Professor Grips or um, Wise Intelligence Music play in Boston and hip hop. And um, other than that, I am a DJ, club DJ, and a promoter of um, hip hop events in the state. Everybody, uh, my name is Ben Left. Uh, I work with Red Eye Magazine. Red Eye is a nonprofit youth run political hip hop magazine. Uh, we're a national magazine, but we have a strong focus on the Boston area, trying to help accomplish some of the things that Jamal just spoke about. Um, I also want to say thank you to Jamal for setting us up. I think it's a really uh, a, a needed thing in this area, and a lot of other areas too. But God bless. My name is Kiki Breedlife. I am an artist, a hip hop artist in the MC. Um, and I'm also a co founder of Raw Earth, which stands for Real Artistic Women Entering Any Realm Trying to Hinder. And we specialize in working with um, young ur urban youth. Um, specifically female. So, um, and I'm glad that everybody's here today. I see that we're all here for a common cause, and that is to know more whether or not we're for or against whatever we have to say here tonight, but everybody's here for one common cause. Let's know more. Peace. I'm Queen Vivian. Um, I'm affiliated with the Universal Dual Nation, Nation of Islam, and also the Nation of Gods and Earths. Um, I am a youth service coordinator. Um, I teach violence prevention, um, pregnancy prevention, drug prevention, what? Um, and also I'm a playwright. And that's what I do with hip hop. I do hip hop theater. Hi, my name is Kiki Breezy. I am a half of a group seven on esoteric, and um, we've been our records independently since about '95. Uh, started on Brick Records, and uh, yeah, still doing our thing. Harrison 889, thanks to Nomadic. Uh, we did it. Uh, Truth from Brick Records, a local independent hip hop label. What's up, everybody? My name is O'Neill Rowe, uh, one of the owners of Metro Concepts Corporation. We're a marketing and management company. We manage uh, Ed OG, Mr. Liv, Acrobatic. Um, the mastermind, the Rasco, various artists, and we also do uh, regional and national street marketing. Also, the music director for WTCCFM in 
calling for Massachusetts, um, and also an uh, in event promoter in the Springfield and Connecticut area. Hopefully, uh, just do something in Boston, but hopefully give the folks in Boston a chance to come out our way and do some networking. How y'all doing today? Uh, my name is Jonathan Herman. I run a small uh, marketing company called HitMeOff.com. Some of you might have heard of it. Uh, we basically work with independent artists, entertainers, and professional athletes to market them and sort of shine light on people who are less than known and uh, should be known. And I also do some uh, entertainment law in my other life. Peace, everybody. My name is Everett Caseda, um, co-CEO and artist of a Boston-based independent record label called Venom Entertainment. And uh, I want to thank everybody for coming out. Once again, I want to thank Bruno. Thank you for doing this great. And Professor Griff, it's an honor to actually see you on the room with Dr. Bell. Uh, my name is Ebdo. I also represent Venom Entertainment here um, as an artist. But uh, we are so much more than that, you know. <coughs> And uh, I'd just like to, again, also thank Uno for inviting us here. Thank uh, Cliff also, and uh, Wise Intelligent also. Always look up to you brothers. And, uh, you know, thank everybody for coming out. And it's too, you know, it's a shame that this place isn't packed, you know? But uh, thank you for coming out, man. You know, questions. All right. All right, let's give all your panelists a round of applause. Thank you. Yeah, this is a super piece. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's all we need right now. <laughs> well, I got a series of questions I want to ask, and I hope one of don't mind if I just kind of uh, ask some of the questions that are not on the paper because I see right now. I defer to the professor. <laughs> <laughs> Audience is kind of hesitant. Y'all kind of shy. Um, the first question I need to ask, but we don't have to get an answer from everyone on the panel. And please make it short, all right? Who would like to give the audience the basic fundamental definition of what hip hop is? All right, don't everybody speak at one time and ask the question again. <laughs> a fundamental definition, listen, y'all gonna understand something about me. Ain't none of y'all paying my damn tag, all right? And if nobody ain't whipping my ass, son, we're gonna do is we're gonna do it right, all right? I'm about the shortest person in here, but I know why I've got my back. <laughs> <laughs> So y'all gotta talk black to me, all right? For real. If we really gonna deal with it, then let's deal with it. Or else, let's just shut the fuck up and let's leave and go, let's do something else. Now, uh, uh, do we do this? So, give me something back. All right? So I can get my ass back on the plane and go home, for real. I didn't come up here for nothing. Griff, I'd like to answer that. If I all right. Oh. <laughs> I try to stop that over here, you know? No. Um, Basically, I think hip hop is just a, uh, a form of expression that um, has been taken from a lot of different cultures, as, as we spoke about, or as, as Uno spoke about earlier. And, um, and you know, it's being taken to a, a more of a business level lately. But I, you know, I honestly, personally, see it as a uh, as a form of expression through music for our generation. Okay, how about the generational point? I'm not gonna get it. Who else would like to First of all, when I was growing up in the Bronx, there was no such thing as hip hop. I never heard the word hip hop. I started hearing about hip hop after um, money started being made off an art form that kids just basically, um, you could say that it was part of their culture in the Bronx. And some people might want to debate where it started, Bronx or Queens, but I'm from the Bronx. And I remember when brothers were hooking up their set to light posts and basically just, you know, emceeing at parties and, and emceeing in, you know, at clubs and not clubs, but um, in the park, block parties. And um, what I think hip hop is today is, is pretty commercial. Um, but when I think about hip hop, I go back to the beginning. I remember when I was a child, and I feel like it's it's just a voice of soul soul music. It's a post 
of the people in the, in the urban urban community, you know, or should I say black people? Okay. All right, now since we got a fundamental definition of what hip hop is, both from the sisters and the brothers, men and women, let's deal with this now. From a woman's perspective, what does matters eat today? Anybody seen this? No? Well, anyway, every time I see it, it's, it's King Magazine, the illest men's magazine ever. But, <laughs> but on the cover, they got the sister from uh, City High. Remember the group City High? And every time I see women, women are being used in hip-hop to sell a product. And it's always, y'all are always half clad with your legs cocked open and being used. Now, I want to know personally, how do y'all feel about that? And then the second part of that question, yeah, they got to put your thinking caps for this one. The second part of that question is this. Since hip-hop has been co-opted, and in the book, the American Directory of Certified Uncle Tom, he talks about how white men, stupid white men, have taken hip-hop and niggerized it. So I want to hear from white people today, young white people that probably had nothing to do with that. What are y'all going to do to help get hip-hop back on its right track and put not only the black woman, but every other woman back in her proper role and her proper place? Talk to me. We'll talk to them. Um, Anyone. Okay. Well, coming from my perspective, I'm disgusted with the display of women in hip-hop on videos and then with the young woman, um, you know, young teenage girls feeling that they have to be like that in order to be accepted in hip hop. Um, I always try to promote images or let women know, let young women know and men know that you don't have to be like that in order to be accepted to hip hop. And how do, I mean, it's just all over the place. It's hard to avoid it. I, I struggle in my brain how to fix that. You know, I try my best. I try from my own point of view what I can do. But, um, I mean, how do we let the masses know that this isn't what hip hop is about? I mean, the woman, the girl from City High, I mean, do you even remember the other two dudes from City High? No, you just remember the girl from City High. And it's all about image. I mean, if she was a heavy set woman, you know, um, you know, with locks or whatever, you know, like, would she get as much exposure if she does now? You know, just stuff like that. And just, just stuff. Well, let me add on to that question. Here we have, um, towards the end of the book, I mean, the magazine, Hip Hop Honeys. And there's about 15 chicks on here, just everything exposed. But right, is that how black women and other women want to be seen in hip hop? I'm sure we have some positive images out there that we can um, that we can turn to and say, okay, here's a delicate balance. There are some women that's going to do this. But what does that say when we have to turn around and deal with R. Kelly situation? Because they say sex sells. Who are we selling it to? Who are we going to use to sell it? Are you following me? Anybody else would like to deal with that from the panel? I think you, you said a good, you made a good point right there. The dollar is really dictating what's on the covers of these magazines. You know, this this magazine you're talking about came from XXL, which is just a part, you know, I mean, just a copycat of the source. You know, so they made a men's magazine, so they're going to have women all throughout this this, uh, this mag who are so-called hip-hop females just to sell magazines. Now, it really comes down to where they, you know, is the dollar dictating the art form now? And if that's the case, then brothers like yourself and Wise Intelligent and, and cats that we work with and, and cats probably on, on this panel that are making positive music, we need to figure out how do we get more dollars to those people? You know, how do we get, you know, independent artists that are having good messages and that aren't trying to do that uh, on the covers of magazines? Well, let me do an amendment to the question. 75% of hip-hop are bought by white people, young white people in the suburbs. All right, I have the book in my bag and I can pull it out and keep my back. Let's not even trust that. And I don't want you to think I'm up here calling names. And I like to say too that when we leave it, oh, we don't have a plan. Because if we don't got a plan, we got leave it. <laughs> you know what I'm it, it, spelled, it spelled out. It spelled out in a very unique, unique kind of way in this book called Stupid White Men by Michael Moore. Now, I didn't write this, and I don't know Mike, all right? He's not this one anyway. All right, so now, we need to understand this. 
What's going, white people are benefiting. They are the ones who are really, really, really rich from this hip hop game. Trust me, they are. Am I about to wrong, lies? They are the billionaires. You may see us on TV flossing, but that's another story. They are making the money. From old, 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 used up 50s and 60s contracts that they're still using in the music industry. So white people are benefiting. The young white man in hip hop today probably um, don't want to operate that way. Well, what can we do, what can they do to put this thing back on the right track? I don't necessarily need to hear from young white men. Anybody can talk to me. Yes, sir. I think the solution is to change things on the demand side. And our generation is pretty much, our, demand, our, our desires and demands are pretty much established because we are set in our ways as adults. But the children, the fourth and third graders and such, we need to reach them at this point and change, not change, but form their minds so their value system doesn't demand a negative woman to buy a magazine. That doesn't stimulate them. Whereas information might be more stimulating, valuable information might be more stimulating. So we have to form their minds to respect. We have to form the minds of the, reform the minds of the youth to respect uh, progressive information, valuable information more than sensation. Um, or, you know, the shape of curves and hips and things. So if we said crack sells more than any of these records, long as there are people out there creating demand for crack, crack will sell? Yes. You can't sell what people want buying. Okay. Yes, sir. I think the first thing you got to do is remove the invisible hand that's supposedly dictating and controlling everything. <laughs> oh, yeah, we're going to laugh at you, brother. <laughs> I threw it to the brother. <laughs> yeah, all right. dissected and then removed, removed the cancer. Okay. I think basically if you're talking about who the suppliers and who the demand is, um, working with youth have come to realize that the youth are the people in demand and the suppliers are us as adults. And if, especially if we're um, not doing our job as adults and just keep supplying them with garbage, the kids are going to keep wanting more garbage. Um, it's like we can go way back to how um, music, music in general is influential, hip hop especially is influential to our urban youth. So if you have, if you put somebody out there who wants to talk about, you know, how peanut butter and jelly is the greatest food in the market, you're going to have a whole bunch of kids just want to come up and buy peanut butter and jelly. So I think we're not taking into um, consideration as adults and as um, not only the artists, but the distributors, people who are behind the whole music, the ones who have the money, who are in control, are not are not taking responsibility and seeing how this might affect the whole culture, a whole um, union of people. So basically, I think we need to um, play our role, do what we have to do, and um, you know, so give the kids what they want instead of, and what they need, I'm sorry, what they need instead of what they want. I, I agree with that, if I can speak on that. Um, I think that it, it's definitely a supply and demand cycle. And I think um, this brother's point about what people want and what the demand is for these things, um, there's really no way to change what the demand is until there's alternatives put in place to what we have right now. <coughs> if all we have is a Jay-Z to choose from and all we have is uh, Eminem and folks like that, then 
the, the, uh, the choices go down and, and people can't really uh, express what they want to buy through their choices at the record store. We don't really have that choice. It's definitely a control issue. I think there's a lot of things that are going on right now as far as the control yep. of hip hop goes. Internet is a very important medium for that. My company is working on, on uh, things in that area. I know the Slam Jam, mm -hmm. which uh, Griff is also associated with, is trying to reshape uh, who controls uh, this vehicle. The Internet is wide open right now. No one person controls it. So my, my perspective is that this is our opportunity to take control over what we put out, how we market it, how we promote it, and who gets the proceeds from it. So uh, I think right. that's one well, just, just to add on to what you said, there's 3,000 albums that come out a year, probably more. So there's, there are other choices on that Eminem and Jay-Z. There's a lot of underground hip hop hip hop groups that are out there that are saying some uh, very positive things. It's just that the buffer is set up. So when they try to go to the label, the people are set up to tell them, look, we're not looking for that right now. We're looking for this. So if you want to get signed, if you're not looking like this and sounding like this and doing this, then no thank you. But hold on. Thank you. I got, a um, I got a comment over here from the system. Okay. Yeah. Um, about the point around the misogyny and sexism that's portrayed on me, on the different venues or things that come out, I think we do have a responsibility and we have vehicles in our community, to, but we also need to support those venues, such as our churches, and our museums or galleries, which is what ha what is happening in Boston right now, and has been happening for about a few years. Um, so we can't say that it's not happening, but of course the magnitude is greater when there are those dollars. But we have to keep supporting ourselves and not looking at the other side. Like we have to keep pulling ourselves up on what. Uh, and and I'm sorry, Professor Griff, just to sort of like talk about what's happening in the Boston Cambridge scene, like around, you know, the hip hop before that, um, you know, the jazz scene when people would just come out in the streets and just do their thing or do their theater right in the street. You know, that's what is happening right now. And we need to, you know, each one of us, you know, and I'm probably a, a little bit at, um, at a negative, but around even this conference, like I should, pulled out my forces just to come here, like pulled out at least 10 people to come right here. So this is the type of, this is what our responsibility is for when we see things that other people put out in the, v, in, you know, VCR puts out on the internet, our responsibility is, listen y'all, you, you ready to come down here? I'll pay your way to come in here and get some knowledge and, you know, read the Black Scholar, you know, Talk to people that have been outside of the country and see how they've been influenced by our positive moves of what's going on. And that actually comes right back to us to say, you know, a lot of people say, okay, I'm not going to show that thong or, we, you know, wear this. But, you know, we do have to do the work, and we are doing the work, you know. So that's all I wanted to say. Can I comment on, on the building on what, um, on what she just said? You know, pop culture is a, is a billion dollar industry. Uh, and unless anyone in here got a billion dollars, you're not going to change the demand side. But I think when we make a mistake is we're looking to pop culture to change what our, you know, what the people in the community are thinking, what our young people are thinking, when the reality is we should be looking to the organizations in the community. We should be looking around at each other in this room. How many 15, 16, 17 year olds are in this room? Where are they at? Because those are the people that grow up on pop culture. Those are the ones that get these images in their heads and start living that lifestyle. So I think we're making a mistake. We shouldn't be looking to these artists or these magazines. I, I agree with what Matt said, and, and, and to move forward on that, we definitely put the call out. And sometimes when you put the call out, you can't deal with who answers. So the youth was invited here, we got the elders here, we got the brothers and the sisters here. But what I want to do though, is like make sure that everybody in this room, because see, what I believe is like, we talk about like like the brother said, uh, you know, do we got a billion dollars? Well, they damn sure getting that money from somewhere. That's right. You see what I'm saying? Right. So I do believe that we got a billion dollars. Because you know why? Because cats got sneakers, we got PlayStation, we got whatever the hot new DVD is, we got all, we got two ways, we got pay. So I'm not dealing with black people broke no more. That's a dead issue. That's past saying. You understand what I'm saying? Black people got money now. 
Okay? So now what we gotta do is really focus on what we're doing with our money and what we're putting our money forward for. And to bring it locally, like I said, we gotta develop an agenda here. Because what we're gonna do here, because see on this panel right here, watch this now. What does this brother say? Independent artists. You independent artists, why are you independent artists? Because nobody mess with you? Can you get, is it hard to get radio play? Is it hard to get shows? And these brothers right here is knocking out hip hop in two languages. You understand what I'm telling you? I represent hip hop. Okay, let's go on down. This brother right here, lawyer, all right? Your clients, is it easy for you to get a deal or is it a little hard? You gotta do all this. Real hard. It's a challenge. Why? Because I was one of his clients. Holla back. All right. <laughs> I mean, right here. Jay Wu, we got this cat right here. I got emails from this brother before I knew that who the hell he was. You understand what I'm saying? Promotions man from Western Mass, locking it down on the radio. What's happening? Tastemakers, what's the flavor of the month? You understand what I'm saying? So uh, we go over here. We got O'Neill from Metro Concepts. These brothers is putting out promoting stuff all over the, all over. All right. You got Mr. Lift. Cats is doing numbers all over. Every time I open up an underground Lift magazine, I'm seeing Mr. Lift, Mr. Lift, Mr. Lift. I go places. People are like, oh, you from Boston? You know Mr. Lift. So that means that this man been doing his job, right? Okay. We got True Elemental and Esoteric, right? Truth Elemental, half of Brick Records, right? Brick Records, half of these cats that I don't see their faces gonna be out on Brick Records. All right. Uh, this brother right here, Esoteric. Tell it, tell you, because I, I keep telling your story. This is like a testimonial Tony Robbins story. Tell these people, please, how many albums you sold. I don't know, somewhere up for Well, tell them what you told me. <laughs> See, now, number one up, it used to be 20. 25,000 albums this dude sold. You understand what I'm saying? You understand that, Uncle? That may not sound like a lot to people, but that's 25,000 on that. He gets the money directly. You know what I'm saying? Not three, not cut up three or four ways. All right? Now, now you deal with issues with right here, Queen Viv, Zulu Nation. We all know what Zulu Nation been. From the beginnings when I was dealing with hip hop, don't don't make me date myself. HBO, Homeboys Only, Elite, you know? Come on, stop it. Come on, stop it. Stop it. All right? This is what was going down in Boston in the community. You got sisters right here. The reason I call the sisters out is because every time we do something hip hop, like the brothers say, sisters can't come unless you got on the thong. You understand what I'm saying? Damn that, we don't deal with that. We want the sisters here because we value the sisters' opinion. We value what the sisters' work has been done. This sister right here and this sister right here, two of the nastiest MCs, man, woman, boy, girl. Kiki went to New York. Kevin Powell, y'all know Kevin Powell? Yep. Writer? He threw a battle. And what happened at the battle, Kiki? Um, basically, there was 32 contestants. There was um, two females, including me. And um, I won the whole battle. You heard it. 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 You you got this sister, I just told you, bless, listen. Nasty MCs, okay? Do not sleep on your sisters. This sister holding it down on the radio. You see what I'm saying? We don't got no access locally to radio. I can call this sister up and get something on the air. You understand? So right here on this panel, and this is why I put the panel together. Right here on this panel, we got the ability to change this. Now the question is, is we gonna change it? And if we do change it, are the people gonna support it? I think they will. Because I believe that people don't buy like according to supply and demand. I, people, I believe people buy according to what's out there because you can't buy what ain't on the damn shelves. Now with that, I'm going to go to a comment from a skin tour. One of the things that, uh, that particularly I've said everyone, but particularly brothers, uh, we're going to have to really deal with our sexism, brothers. And, um, culture is not just the music, it's also the interaction of the music and with the community and so forth. If we stand up with our sisters and say we're going to end this, no one is going to exploit our sisters. We stand beside them and we're going to fight these devils who are constantly turning women just into flesh and meat and stuff like they're slaves. That is the most blatant sexism there is. And we have to stand up as black men and be accountable to our sisters and to our community. That's very important because if you let it slide, then the devil 
those go away and take it all away. And so forth. You know how this is. So we have to stand up for that and struggle against this. You're talking about the woman who is the mother of everybody on this planet. And we don't take a stand for her, with her. And like if they continue, then develop and organize boycotts. You, I, all of our people created the culture. Stop buying from them suckers. Unless they project images like the sister India I read and, and progressive positive images of black, like a soda and stuff. Don't take it. Does Stevie Wonder made Dr. King a holiday. Uh, an artist that took a stand. We want something bad enough. Y'all know that. We can get it, but we can't just be going along with stuff. They're telling you that your queen, your lady, is the scum of the earth. She's our American whore. How are we going to sit back and go for that? And all oh, this skeezer, bitch, oh, Gucci mama, that's got to go, y'all. Uh, 20 years or so, 25 years ago, we were talking about my sister, the black queen, Asata, Angela Davis, my brother. Now we're talking about dog, bitch, oh, skeezer. Something done happened to us black people. We got to deal with it. What's up to the panel? Some of the people I know. Um, welcome to Boston Wise, um, Professor Griffin. Um, listen, I basically just want to say this briefly. Um, what we got here, he already said it. He already, you know, we got change, right? This is revolution, right? This is revolution in hip hop. This is revolution, period. All right. All everybody right here. If you, if we all on the same page right now, it seems like we all on the same page. We can change this, right? We got producers, we got we got we got artists and shit, we got poets and shit, we got teachers. Every how many degrees are finished, motherfucker? Raise your hand. I'm super, I'm for it. How many degrees are finished? But you don't even have to have a degree. I got a degree from the school of hard knocks. Oh, all right, eight years in the penitentiary. Right. All right, eight years in the penitentiary, and I don't even give a fuck who know about it. Eight years in the penitentiary. All right. Now listen, what I'm saying is. If we walk up out of here, man, for real, man, and, and there's no solution, then, then there's nothing. But we got a history of doing it, coming together on the cause, and it feels real good. It's real romantic to come together for a day, man. Yeah, 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 yeah. You get that good feeling? It's just like taking a hit of crack, yo. For real. You know what I'm saying? Now, once you leave here, once you leave here, and after all the music is gone, all the good shit's gone, yeah, you're going back to your perspective lives and shit. You know what I'm saying? I understand everybody got their own issues at home and sit babies and works and jobs and stuff like that, right? But if you feel it, if you feel this very, very passionately, you need to do something. Right. I know everybody got independent labels and independent things and things that they do in this art form and shit. But if we like can like get our emails together and get connected and shit, man, we can boot them on them on them on um fuck entertainment television cat out of here. For real. We can boot some cats out of here, real. We can put our own Real folks up in there, for real, man. You know, I'm just a poet, man, for real, man. That's all I got to say. And I, I want to say that this brother right here, business owner, they're one of the realest brothers I've had. If I tell this brother 805, it's 804. You understand what I'm saying? All right? Owns a business, 381 W Street, it's common sense. Whatever you want, he probably got it. You understand what I'm saying? And we need to support black business as well, because that's a bigger component of what's going on. We got to support each other. Look. I tell you all my personal problems. I drink Heineken every day. Damn, if I don't find some Heineken somewhere and spend money on it. So we gotta start spending money with each other like we spend money on everything else. You understand what I'm saying? Me included. Holla. All right? Now right now, we gonna bring this on. My fault, right quick, because I just wanna bring in the Boston issue. We gonna have to get to the Boston issue, because locally, what we gonna do locally? Sister got a comment. Yeah, I just wanted to make one comment. Um, um, Askia mentioned how the brothers have to respect us, but sisters, we gotta respect ourselves. Basically, basically, I have seen some respectful brothers turn into dogs by females. Okay, because if that's all you think you are is a bitch or a hoe, then you're not gonna be able to appreciate a king or a god or someone accepts to you with some knowledge. You're not even gonna be able to accept it because you think that you're, you know, you're that bitch or that hoe. You know, so that's something that I bring to the table, and that's refinement. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to take an opportunity to build on what everybody has been saying and give thanks to 
tomorrow and the other organizers of this conference to create a public forum a dialogue. I think it's a beautiful thing. I think it should be happening in Roxbury. No offense, MIT, but I would like to see how it. Well, there's a point. We ain't got no venue. Why don't we have venue? We don't have a radio station either, do we? Neither, because they want to charge us up. That's what they want to do. Oh, so I'm they charge $100 an hour. This oh, hey, there's a way to change that. Well, why is it free at MIT? That's the question. Because there's a good system who's a dean here who looked it up because of how she built it up. Sister Temple, yes. Okay. 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 Okay
that's not um, that we don't want to be represented as, you know. So. Wait, let me clear that up now. <laughs> I knew you would. The name of the song is Give the Peace What They Need. Alright. So we portrayed the women like they're already being portrayed. But we're putting a circle and an X to them to let the people know that's not what you need. Alright, cool. So we're giving you that. So I think you should understand that. Right. But, no, but no, don't get me wrong. She was absolutely 1,000% correct. Step to them and ask them. Yeah. What the hell is going on there? Because that's what I said. I'm like, wait a minute, what's the going on there? No, for real. I mean, because them chicks up in there was looking like... Well, anyway, yeah. <laughs> and as you said, you had a 50-minute conversation, so brothers didn't answer and address. Right. But, yeah, yeah. but she said, she said, she said, that's the premise. And that's what each one of us should do. Don't be afraid to step to KRS One and ask her about the Timbo and Hip Hop. Don't be afraid to step to Wise or Grip or anyone else. Or Uno and ask him about Kill Money. Give thanks. <laughs> that's one good thing. Well, I wasn't going really, there, but I did do my research and I wanted to ask you about that. And there is a chapter in here called Kill Whitey. So anyway, you want to like my publisher? Oh, I hear you. Hi. I would like to make a comment. And you made a very good point there. Um, a lot of people are afraid, and the thing that holds our people back so much is that we are we have this fear, and it's this fear of failure. But it's not a fear of failure of doing something bad. It's a fear of failing at doing something that's really good. And like with what Mike um, Michael Barnes said up there, he said, you know, a lot of us need to go out there and start our own organizations, and you know, start talking to more of our youths and our kids to try to get their ears open to what they do need. What we need to understand that we don't need to be afraid. If we're doing something that's positive, something that's good, that has an opportunity to change someone else's life, life, if they don't have to go through what we had to go through, you know, or what our ancestors have to, if we have that opportunity, go out and do it. Don't be afraid because you're not going to be a failure in the end. You're only going to be a winner no matter what. Whether you end up broke, whether you have, end up poor, whether you have, well, you, nobody likes you. So what? You're still a winner because you have helped somebody. You touched somebody's life in a, in a positive way. And they don't have to um, go turn into drugs, the streets, or getting themselves self -sui um, into suicide because they had no one reaching out to them. So that's why it's important. You need to just go out there and start your own thing. Don't be afraid. And don't be afraid to fail if you're doing something good. And one more thing. Uh, I'd like to ask the audience, where are all the B-girls in the audience? You know, the, the females. Where are all the B-girls in the audience? Y'all even know what a B girl is? All right. Well, uh, uh, that's a female that has, you know, that shows support for hip hop through, you know, one of the four elements of hip hop, you know? And we need to support. Our females need to come out to the events. You know, I see a lot of, uh, of, of white girls who break, a lot of white girl DJs, but I go to all the events and there's, there are no sisters, you know? Sisters need to come to the events and they need to to find out what a B girl is, you know. Um, learn about break dancing, DJ, and the backbone of hip hop, the cornerstone of hip hop, hip hop music. Y'all need to understand that. You know, I get up on stage and I say these things, but it's, it, you know, it like goes in one ear right out the other. That's why I brought my little sister here so she could understand exactly what hip hop is about and you know why she should be, she should have an interest in the art form that one it's it's like the most popular art form the world you know worldwide you yeah, know it's affecting a lot of um, people's lives right multinational corporations are exactly. taking hip hop exactly and use hip hop to sell their products on a global scale and those of y'all in the audience that travel you know what I'm talking about I mean I was walking down a dark 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 street in Paris France and there's hip hop. I'm in Japan, there's hip hop. I'm in Sydney, Australia. I mean, I'm in the jungles of Australia, there's hip hop. You understand what I'm saying? So, you know, they're using it and they're making money. We just need to understand it. You understand what I'm saying? Now, now here in the jungles of Boston, <laughs> what I want to know, I want to know, I ask some specific questions. Okay, so like from the panel, from like, uh, brothers like, okay, uh, Tim from Metro, uh, and, and, and the truth from Britain. Specifically, since y'all have the uh, the distribution, uh, promotional experience, and the record label experience, what is it about the Boston hip hop scene? It seems like some artists get promoted and do moderately to reasonably damn well, 
and others are struggling on this brink of obscurity never heard of, even myself, like we're all on the same internet group, so we can go there. Some of the debates that happen for Uno the Prophet is, who the hell are you? What you do? What you done? Nobody know you. And it's like, damn, you don't know me not because I don't exist, you don't know me because you don't know. You see, there's a difference there, all right? Now, so I want to know how can we can bring all these people here to the forefront. When I put this show together, the show is about showing and proving. So I'm not just going to tell people, I hate all these hip-hop shows, everything sucks. We're going to put together a hip-hop show where we think how it's supposed to go. With a lecture and a panel, and we're going to have some discussion, and we got all these people here from the community. So how do we, as artists from the community, where the hip-hop sprang from, right here in Boston, how do we gain some of that exposure and some of that press and some of that distribution? How do we move forward like that? If I or anyone in this room knew the answer to that question specifically, how you phrased it, it'd be a great thing because we'd all be eating a lot better. I wouldn't have to work two day jobs and do the label on top of that and whatnot. Even even on the label, a couple of my favorite records that I think were like the best records that we put out were some of the worst sellers. I don't know. I put out we put out records we like that we believe in. Some of the records do well, some of them don't, we put the same amount of effort between behind every record. So that's a question. Maybe other people could give some insight to us on. What, what, what's, your, what's your side of that? Hold on, hold on, hold on, one second. I mean, coming from a manager's perspective, it's my job to open up opportunities for my artists. My artists have publicists, that's how they get impressed. We send out every project we do to the same mailing list and follow up with a call on a business level and say, you know, Mr. Lipscomb will be in the New York Times on, 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 Saturday, on July 7th. You know, that's not because of me, but we hired a, an effective publicist. You know, um, you know, L and P and Rex are opening for P D. I mean, they're gonna access these these consumers that we just up. did yesterday. Holla back, <laughs> summer jam, y'all. And uh, you know, we're, they're gonna access these these consumers we were talking about uh, and, and bring their music to, to the masses. And, and you know, it's it's our job to open up opportunities for them. You know, if there's a formula, I think you know, we'd all get rich. Selling that formula. Right. But, but I left my job for music, so it's my job to find opportunities, and I don't get paid if my artists don't sell records, and, and that's the bottom line. And I kept my job so that we can still pay our artists 50%. Thanks, good, thanks. Now, I say this because, see, my thing is now, see, they, they just gave some, some very crucial answers because when I entered into this thing, I thought, I thought the Truth Elemental was my enemy, I thought that Esoteric was my enemy. You understand what I'm saying? Because what I saw beforehand was just this. But then in conversations with him, because give thanks on that person to ask first, I found out that we have more in common. That's why they're here. So I respect that, what you said. So he don't got the answer. So now the new question becomes, how can we sit, the, sit down together and turn this now into some sort of round table thing that has an ongoing thing where we can begin to form and shape what's going on in hip hop in Boston, at least here, and maybe serve that as some national model with the expertise of going there because see, you know how to get a publicist. I can't get no publicist to want to publicize nothing I'm doing. You see what I'm saying? So how do we how do we market it? How do we get all that together? How can we get Venom on? See what I'm saying? How, how, how does this happen? So we need to have some sort of round table when we leave here. Everybody in this room that got something to contribute, we need some numbers. We need to form some sort of uh, committee, some, some sort of... Uh, group that we're going to move together, a unit, a, 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 a united front, and move this thing forward. Because we got the power here. We got the power here. Truth is in the business of putting out music. Okay, so let's give him more of a variety of music to put out so that people can have more variety of music to buy, which increases his chances, I believe, in my humble opinion, his, his chances of selling more records. Let's get, let's get O'Neal on the job so that we're all working together so that this, this uh, underground so-called thing can move to the above ground. That's what I'm talking about doing. Now, I want to ask y'all all this too and get the comment from the system, so. No, I just wanted to say that, you know, of course we all have busy lives. And um, I think as far as Boston is concerned, there's a lot of artists that don't really take themselves serious. 
And what happens is, you know, they want to jump on, up on stage and do a lot of shows, but when it comes to business, sorry, Cindy, I know I'm taking this from you. <laughs> Cindy did. Um, they, you know, they don't make appointments on time. They don't show up at all. You know, and it's not like we don't have the resources here in Boston. We have the resources. But you're going to give the resources to the people that are serious and going to be respectful of your time. So I just wanted to put that out there, you know. And it might be that some, you know, some of the artists need to learn a little bit more about the business because we know that, you know, 95% of it is business and not on the stage. And this is where the people like Jonathan is going to come into play, and, and brothers like O'Neill is going to come into play because those who don't know the business need to be taught the business, or we can't be held accountable for not knowing the business. And also, on top of that, I want to ask critical questions like, how do we think the race impacts this? We come from Boston, which is uh, rumored to be one of the most racist places in the world. You know this place is so segregated. You understand? Italians live here. Irish live here. Black people live here. Puerto Ricans live here. You understand what I'm saying? How do we think that that impacts hip-hop? Because I think the hip-hop hip community, so to speak, is very, very segregated. You understand what I'm saying? There's people, like for instance, the people that question me, like, who the hell are you? They name me their favorite rapper. I'm like, who the hell are they? Because we live in two different communities, and, and we do not know exactly the haves and the have-nots. So now, do we, do we acknowledge that there's a glass ceiling here, that all these wonderful resources that we talk about, that we got, and we know we can get? Do we, do we believe that they are equally distributed to the different people? Because I don't believe that. I believe, I know for, for him, I'll give you a good scenario. Now, how many of y'all going to the show at the Middle East tonight? I want y'all to, when you go to, you ask for Mark Hamilton. Okay? And you tell Mark Hamilton he my ass. He treated me like crap. For me to spend my money to get a venue that I didn't even want to get, holla back. Okay? I'm being real. I'm being real. I'm paying my money for a venue that I don't even want to be at because I got no other choices. And that means what? That he can talk to me any old kind of way that he want to. You understand what I'm saying to you? Because I don't have no venue dealing with 600 people that I can get my people into. You understand what I'm saying? These are the type of conditions we're dealing here. we got to acknowledge that the resources are there, no doubt. But I, I can't even get some phone calls returned if you're dealing with distribution or something. And I know it ain't because my product is good, because the CD that I put out, just myself, poorly produced, poorly engineered. 22 tracks on there, five of them number one radio hits. And can't get no radio play here in Boston. Safe system. And I know... Hot 97, 94, and all that. You understand what I'm telling you? So we got to come up out of this room with what it is that we can do. How can we link up? See, because the female MCs ain't getting no shine. Kiki needs to have an album out. You see what I'm saying? Bliss needs to have an album out. Matter of fact, whoever in here is down to put me down, I defer. Put them down first. You see what I'm saying? Because there's more stuff out there that needs to be out there that's even more important than what the cats is kicking. You see what I'm saying? So we got to promote this. That's why I brought it be the summer jam. You see what I'm saying? Because people need to see it be, and people need to see it be with me. Because this is Roxbury, y'all, and that's Cambridge. You see what I'm saying? People think I hate Cambridge. I don't hate Cambridge. I love Cambridge. You see what I'm saying? I love the people in Cambridge. I hate what the city of Cambridge do to their people in Cambridge. <laughs> like, when y'all hear me holler at Roxbury, y'all don't get it twisted. I know I don't own Roxbury. I just occupy space there. What are we going to do here for Boston Hip Hop? How can we break down these walls? How can we break these barriers and build these bridges? Cindy Diggs from UMMF. Us making moves. How long? Forever. How long? As soon as you got on the Boston topic, you knew I had to get up. <laughs> Mother Hip Hop, whatever you want to call me, Miss Diggs, now the team's call me. But what I want to say regarding promotions, there is an answer to that because I've been doing promotions way before a lot of people on the panel except for James Lewis representing, he was holding it down for Beantown. Right now is the campaign that we're doing with the Boston Public Health Commission. If anyone was at the AIDS walk, we had a hip-hop performance for the first time in front of 10,000 people, and that's what hip-hop is needed for, the voice of the young people. So when you see me, I represented every single artist, anybody that was coming out of here, I don't care. If you had beef with just the next crew, whatever, you was going to get down. If you see this fly at the end of the night, 
you'll see that Edo G is sitting next to Antonio Ennis, who is the owner of Antonio and Sally. That's hip hop history. All of that, y'all. And big up to the bunch of my, my line, the Raven Benzino, who everybody hates for being a gangster or whatnot, but all I can ever see for being from right there, from around the way, is the brother, you talking about pulling yourselves up by your bootstraps? Okay? You talking about making something from nothing? Got more money than everybody who ever said anything bad about him. Okay? Listen, right now there's a comment from Brother VCR. For those who don't know, this brother be holding it down for the spoken word scene, for the cultural scene, for hip hop. A lot of y'all might have heard about this through this brother right here. You understand? Thanks, Jamal. And thank you for uh, putting this panel on. You know, thanks for everybody coming out here. Um, recently, I've been a little teed off because, you know, it's been years since I tried to put the word out, you know, for folks and um, trying to get people to come in, check out these events, especially with poetry because, you know,